welcome to the Living Plate Teaching Kitchen, where we're changing the conversation around food and nutrition so you can meet your health goals with less stress in the kitchen. I'm Jeannie Petrucci, registered dietitian nutritionist, and today I'm being joined by childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Jill is a pediatric nutritionist and registered dietitian who has committed her 27 year private practice career to helping parents nourish healthy kids and establish healthy habits that last a lifetime. She is an author, speaker, and has a podcast. And I'd like to welcome you to my kitchen, Jill. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. So could you please share with our dinner guests um, a little bit about your mission? Sure. So I am all about childhood nutrition and feeding kids and everything I do is sort of wrapped and revolved around that. What I'm super excited about today is we're going to be talking about family meals. And in my line of work, to me, family meals are one of the most effective strategies to building healthy eaters. So I'm super excited that we'll get to uh, talk about that today. And cook up some healthy food, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, so, terrific. Yeah. Um, so before we dive, we're going to be, Jill's going to be talking a little bit about her principles. Um, but what we're going to do first is uh, reveal the menu to you for today, what we're going to be demonstrating. Um, so we're going to start with strawberry mountains, banana boats, and apple crisp wheels. How does that sound? Yummy to me. That's great, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter whether you are two or 92. Um, it is all good. Um, it's going to be delicious and balanced. And so as I prepare um, that dish, Jill's going to be uh, talking about one of her principles. And then next, we're going to make pizza soup with cheddar dippers. Also sounds delicious. Yes. Um, so we're going to be uh, making that and enjoying that together. And we're going to uh, finish with chicken street tacos. And it, the chicken street tacos, is uh, they're made with a lot of uh, prepared ingredients ahead of time. So you can just kind of put it together for a quick family meal. Uh, but most importantly, kids can kind of get involved in that process. Um, and we're going to give you two options. Uh, we're going to do the ch chicken street tacos in a tortilla. And then we're also going to do them on a cracker. Awesome. Okay. I love it on the cracker. <laughs> right? Super simple, super fun. It's going to be great. Um, and just um, to note, we are going to be using uh, Simple Mills products today as a disclosure. Uh, Simple Mills does uh, sponsor postings in our meal plans, um, but we would never recommend a product that we don't use ourselves in our kitchens and, and a product that we love. Uh, and this definitely falls into that category. So um, why don't we just uh, go ahead and get started with the first recipe, Jill, if that's okay. I'll sure. um, read through the recipe and uh, show everybody the ingredients. We're so, good to go? Yeah, while you're doing that, maybe what I'll do is talk about family meals a little bit. Perfect. Um, because there are so many benefits. Um, and I know probably if you're a parent out there listening, you've probably heard this so many times that, you know, family meals are so important, yet at the same time, they can be so incredibly stressful yes. and uh, they can cause a lot of guilt if you're not you know, feeling like you're having successful family meals or even able to get your family around the table. I did want to mention a couple of statistics, though. 10% um, of families don't even get together for family meals, which um, I hope that's none of you out there. I hope that all of you out there are making an effort to pull your family around the meal table. Know how challenging that is to, um, you know, get family around the table. What we want to see families doing, though, just to give a benchmark, is at least three times a week pulling that family, that group of yours, be it large or small, around the table. And it doesn't matter if it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and heck, it can be snack time if that's all you can get um, together for. But there are a lot of benefits about having family meals together. Should I talk about those now, Jeannie? Uh, are you Sure. Why don't I, why don't I um, read through the recipe first, sure. which has literally three ingredients. So um, don't worry about it. And uh, then we can move forward. Is that good? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. So um, if you, if you pre-registered for this live event, I went ahead and send you the recipes. We actually caught an error on one of the recipes. So you're going to get everything over again. We're going to correct that. Um, but uh, if you're watching this as a recording, um, you can still register and we'll go ahead and send you uh, these recipes along with some terrific handouts um, that Jill gave us as downloads. So the recipe that I'm going to demonstrate right now is called Strawberry Mountains with Dark, dark Chocolate Chips. Um, and you know, getting children, I so Jill and I each have four children. Um, and we, we are experts on our children, not experts 
kids on your children. But we, again, we're going to be sharing strategies with you. So uh, to kind of help you out. Um, uh, so getting children involved in the process of making snacks and meals is really important. Um, so we're trying to make it fun. So here's an example of making uh, this recipe fun. So to haul a strawberry, and if the child is old enough to handle a paring knife, that's a great lesson. But if not, um, all you need is a steel straw. I'm actually going to hold it in front of my apron here so maybe you can see it. A steel straw, and you poke it through the bottom of the strawberry, and you push and look what happened. Can you see that, Jill? Yes, I can. That is hole the, popped right off. How fun is that? Plus, we're not wasting a lot of the strawberry because the hole just came right off. So I'm going to, to while Jill talks, I'm actually going to haul a few of these strawberries. I'm going to be dipping them in yogurt. Um, we're going to be using uh, Siggy's yogurt today um, because it's higher in protein and lower in sugar. Um, but as far as the kids concerned, all they care about is that it's going to stick to my strawberry and taste great. Um, so that's what we're going to be using. And then we're going to roll it in some dark chocolate chips. So awesome. go ahead, Jill. Awesome. That sounds great. Okay. Just quickly, some of the benefits about having family meals together. Remember, we're, we're aiming for at least three times a week, five times a week, even better. Um, number one, connection and communication. I think that's one of the most important things. Um, and so when you're planning and preparing meals, there are lots of ways that you can connect with your children around the preparation and the planning. Uh, but it also is a way for your family to communicate together and to really build that adhesion and those familial relations. We also know you can role model. You can show your child manners. You can show your child a healthy plate. You can show your child how you pace your eating. That um, children learn so many things from coming to the table. Obviously, the research is telling us that there are so many more benefits like academic achievement, lower risk taking behaviors, um, social skills, uh, lower depression and anxiety. There's just a lot of goodness that can come from family meals. So I hope I've convinced you at least yeah. that the benefits there <laughs> exist. Um, and there, there are a lot of strong benefits. Great. Can I ask you your opinion on something? Because it just occurred to me. So we do as much as possible. We always have um, tried to get around the, the table as much as possible during the week. And we keep, we still have it, um, an easel with a chalkboard in our dining room so that if the children are finished eating ahead of us or um, they just get a little restless, we'll do like hangman or word games or just some fun things to keep them as part of the conversation, even though they might be finished eating. Uh, yeah. You know, otherwise they were just sitting there looking, you know, know, at all of us. And so what are your thoughts on that? And feel, I free, love to that. Free, feel free to tell me that's a terrible idea. No, but I love that. Okay. I love that idea. And, um, you know, I think one of the things uh, that comes up for parents a lot is, you know, how long should my child sit at the table? And I think that we have to remember that when kids are really young, um, toddlers, preschoolers, their attention span is a lot smaller or shorter. So I always say expect a young child to sit at the table 15 to 20 minutes, an older child 20 to 30 minutes, a teenager can sit probably as long as an adult um, if they don't have somewhere else to be. But keeping those, <laughs> you know, keeping those expectations in the right place, but yeah. certainly finding uh, ways to engage your child, uh, you know, around the table obviously makes it more enjoyable for them. And we'll talk about that principle in a little bit. But I do want to quickly get to planning and preparing because family meals can cause a lot of stress for parents. Part of that stress comes from feeling like you're not prepared and feeling like you don't know what to make for dinner or feeling like it's not healthy enough or feeling guilty about what your child what your child wants to eat versus what you are wanting to feed them. Yes, so, the guilt. Yes. Yeah, the guilt. So planning what your week is going to look like is always a good technique around uh, successful and low stress family meals. Now I work with some families that they cannot do a full week dinner meal plan. And so I say do a 24 hour meal plan. Just plan tomorrow. Keep it really simple. And even um, many, many parents that I know find the what's for dinner question to be the most uh, stressful one. They've got breakfast nailed down. They've got lunch. They know what they're doing for snacks. But dinner, dinner can throw everybody uh, into a little bit of a, a stressful swirl. Okay. So even if you just plan dinner meals for the week and shop so that you have those ingredients on hand, that can be hugely beneficial. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Yeah. Food, 
Food balance is another thing, making sure that you have a balanced plate, a protein source, a whole grain, um, or a regular grain, depending on how you're balancing that. Fruits, vegetables, dairy or a non-dairy substitute if you need it. But having that, striking that balance, and for a lot of families, uh, they get a little bit hung up on vegetables. My child won't eat vegetables. Well, you know what? Add fruit to the menu. There you go. Serve those vegetables. Make those. Make sure those show up. But you can also offer fruit at the same time. Many children will have fruit, um, and if they don't eat their vegetables, then at least you know, you know, they're getting some of those similar nutrients out of fruit. Yes. Yeah. Good, very, very good points. So, and as I'm taking you through these three recipes, you can talk about the balance that you just introduced. Sure. Uh, so uh, just to note, if you are watching live and you have any questions um, for Jill or myself, uh, please type them in the feed and we will answer them as we can. So we do have a question. Jill, can you read that question? What are your strategies for incorporating more vegetables onto <laughs> the plate for picky eaters? <laughs> So I wrote an entire book about this, so I said <laughs> we're going to share at the end called Try New right. Food. Um, vegetables are always such a pain point for parents. Number one, I always say, you know what? Make the vegetables for you. Make that a family meal. Don't make the vegetable for your picky eater, but make it for the whole family. And keep in mind that, you know, a big piece of our job as parents is to expose our kids to a wide variety of foods, including vegetables. So don't give up. Um, a lot of parents, after experiencing some sort of rejection two or three times, four times with vegetables, they'll just say, okay, that vegetable's off the list. I'm not right. going to make it anymore. Yet we know from our research that children can uh, require 15, 20, 50 different exposures to that same vegetable before they might actually move the needle and taste it. So if you're doing broccoli and you want your child to eat broccoli, serve it up sauteed, roast it, put it in a cream of broccoli soup. Cheddar make cheese Cheddar up. cheese on top is a, mag a magical sprinkle, right? Yeah, absolutely. But make it show up in a lot of different varieties and forms. And then last, in, a picky e in the case of picky eating, never force your child to eat it. Never put too much pressure on your child to take a bite. Um, many children need a very subtle and gradual positive exposures before they'll actually take a taste. And a taste is different than eating. A taste is just on your taste buds, on your tongue, in your mouth. Um, swallowing that food is actually eating. So our first step as parents is really to help our children taste food and uh, making sure that we're not putting too much uh, negative feeding or negative feeding dynamics into the entire situation. Very so good. So when it's a family meals, Put yep. them on the family table. Um, you know, enjoy eating them as a parent. Have your spouse enjoy eating them too, and you know, just make them really try to normalize them as every as an everyday part of your meal. And your child hopefully will warm up over time. Eventually, yeah. yeah. And you know, one of the reasons why I selected the pizza soup is because the base of the pizza soup is cauliflower. Uh, and when you serve it to your children, Jill, do you need to reveal what ingredients are in the soup and talk about the health benefits? You do not need to reveal those that's ingredients. I, yep, but if they perfect. ask you, if they ask you, sure, you do sure. need to be completely transparent. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny that you bring that up because I, I mean, for, for, I have four children who are spaced wide apart. So for both sets of my children, they eventually got to the point where, you know what, mom, I know it's going to taste great, but I need full disclosure. What is this? What's yes. making this soup creamy? Because I know it's not butter and I know it's not cream. Not that butter and cream are bad, but um, I, I tend to cook with more vegetables. So, you know, eventually they, I, I guess, the children let you know when they're ready to hear and receive that information versus yes. pushing it on them. So when we get, let's, yes. let I'm going to reveal these recipes because I took me three minutes, right? I'll show you yeah. how to do that and then we'll move on to the soup. So here are the strawberry mountains. Can you see those, Joe? Oh, yeah, my mouth. Delicious. Mountain one fell over. over. 
<laughs> yeah. So there we go. It's a, it, they're stable. The one is not so stable, but I did cut off the bottom so that they could stand up. So, you know, serving your children, um, the strawberries with the yogurt and the chocolate chips does make it very balanced, right? So we have our yeah. carbohydrate source, um, yeah. we have, which is the strawberry, um, and also a little bit in the yogurt, and a little bit in the chocolate. Mm -hmm. And then we have a protein source and, and a fat source. Yeah. Um, the, the fat and the protein are in the yogurt and uh, the carbohydrate mostly is in the strawberry. And then the chocolate chips, just because, right? There are health benefits yeah. associated with dark chocolate. So we go through yeah. bags of dark chocolate chips in my family. Uh, so we, and we use Enjoy Life uh, chocolate chips um, because they are allergen free and they come in a variety of sizes, which is fun. So you can do chunk, you can do chip, you can do mini chip, um, and you can do either semi-sweet or dark chocolate. So those are the strawberry mountains. Again, showed you how to hold those. So you just drag them through the yogurt and dip them in. Um, the uh, chocolate chips. I also have sprinkles in my house, which is flax meal. Uh, my children are now old enough to all know that it's flax meal, but when they were younger, it was dust, right? And I would give them a small cup like this. I wanted to show our guests um, this little prep cup. I got it at Crate and Barrel. I have a ton of these. Um, so this is great for small children to um, dip things in. You can just put like a small portion in here mm -hmm. and then they can sprinkle and test as, as they wish. That. I love that idea. Okay. Yeah. So the next thing is the apple, the apple wheel. Uh, I just took an apple, whole apple. Here we mm -hmm. go. I sliced it into, you know, it's probably about a half an inch thick. And then using a very small cookie cutter, which you can get at Michael's. Mm -hmm. I think I got them at Michael's. And you push it through the middle. And you have this cute little, not only do you have a cute little design, but you don't have the seeds. Yes. So rather than picking the seeds out, I did uh, like a flower petal and then I did a star. And That's what cute. I'm going to do here is just take some peanut butter, but you could use any, you could use anything, uh, any other butter alternative here. If you have nut allergies, um, you could use a sun butter. So the, the butter is going to fall through the hole, but that's okay. If it's thick enough, it's, you know, just going to end up on the plate. And then I'm going to sprinkle with some chocolate chips. Honestly, like if as a parent, when I feel uh, a hankering for a cookie or something sweet, this is my go to. Yeah, uh, really is delicious. And it looks fun. Um, I also have, oh, I have some coconut here, put some snow on it. So just fun and delicious. So that's the apple. And then the banana I left whole because I wanted to show you how much fun for the children this little tool is right. Oh, that's little cute. Piece. You just put it on top of the banana and you have the child press. And voila, you have oh. the banana boat. And you take out the pieces and you put some, again, peanut butter. I'm in, my happy, I'm in my happy place now. I know everything's peanut good with peanut on, butter, huh? <laughs> peanut butter on everything. And then you just dip it in dark chocolate chips and it sticks. And again, that's fun. Every one of these little snack items could easily be a meal if it had to be. Because again, like Jill said, it's balanced. We have the carbohydrate, the protein. Um, there's plenty of fiber. Um, and there's also fat from the nuts and the yogurt. So what do you think, Jill? Are those good good recipes for our guests? To I think they're great. And I wanted to make one more point to piggyback back on what you said. And, and that is, you know, snacks in today's world, snacks seem to be sort of singular, a one item food. It might be a lot of parents want their kids to just eat fruit, but um, and fruit is wonderful and crackers are wonderful, but they might not sustain your child's appetite till the next meal. And so what you've done, Jeannie, is add, you know, you've added protein and the yogurt, calcium and vitamin D as well, and you've yeah. added the chocolate chips. You've made it more of a combination mini meal snack, which is always A, more interesting for children, B, more uh, nutritious, and C, more sustaining in terms of the appetite, keeping their appetite satisfied. Yeah. Super important if you want to raise healthy eaters, you have yes. to keep them satisfied. Do we have a question, Anna? Uh, we do have a question. You want to read that, Jill? Because I can't read it from you. Um, any suggestions for doing this recipe for a lactose intolerant child? So I'm presuming you're thinking about the yogurt, right? Yeah, and we can, we can... absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you, guest, for bringing that up um, because it's a point that I really do need to make. All of these recipes can be modified to accommodate all allergens. These are very flexible yeah. recipes. So you simply select a dairy free yogurt, um, or you can use something else just kind of sticky and clingy like a nut butter. Um, yeah. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Did you have any other advice, Jill? 
Um, I would just add on to that, that, um, you know, yogurt oftentimes is lower in lactose. So some children can tolerate uh, yogurt just fine. So again, okay. look at your individual child and see if yogurt is tolerated. If you know it's not tolerated, then yes, go to a dairy free. Or, or uh, lactose free. There are now plenty of lactose, or lactose free yogurts free. on the market. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But like uh, my son is lactose intolerant. He totally tolerates yogurt. It's not okay. a problem. So okay. again, it's, it's an individual, it's an individual tolerance. Okay. Terrific. Um, so I'm uh, actually, if some of you might have noticed that I had a very colorful beverage here. No, I didn't um, get mine. Yeah. Oh, I'm, no, you know what? I'm I'm like sorry. Water. <laughs> <laughs> I should have sent you the recipe ahead of time. Um, so I, I wanted to have this beverage um, to share with you today because it is a, it is a standard in my house. Like the second the the temperature outside get, gets to 50, we start making hibiscus tea like nobody's business. Um, there are so many great hibiscus teas on the market now. So just to find one that brews nice and dark, um, what you do is you take maybe six tea bags and you brew them in really hot water, but only about a cup and a half to two cups of water. So you're making a concentrate. And then you take that concentrate and put it in a mason jar in the fridge. Then you, when you're ready, you take it out um, and you pour it into a glass half and half with water. You could do even club soda to make it like a fuzzy hibiscus, oh. sangria, whatever you'd like. Um, adults, I know what you're thinking. And yes, you can do that too. <laughs> whatever you want to put in this drink for yourself because it is just so yummy. And then sweeten it with whatever you'd like. You need to pick a sweetener that's not going to seed up. So honey is not going to be an option. Um, but you could use um, agave nectar. I use stevia, a nice stevia powder that dissolves really well to sweeten it up. Or you could have it unsweetened. Um, but for the children, I pour it on top of fruit. So in here, I have some grapes. The grapes will sink. The apples will float. So you can have a nice variety in here. Um, nice. If you put some melon in here, the melons actually would be somewhere in the middle. So you have a nice full glass. And I put some a lime. You know, So presenting it like this to the children just makes it so much fun. And uh, again, it's delicious. Your, your children really, at the end of the day, want delicious food. But yes. if it looks fun and it's engaging all on its own, terrific. So that's the hibiscus tea. We'll actually um, send that to you as well as a bonus recipe um, after the podcast. So, you know, so you brought up a point, Jeannie, um, taste and appeal. Those are the two primary factors for children that right. really sort of um, uh, engage them in the food that you're presenting. So if it looks good and it tastes good, you can nail those two factors with food. Great. You're, you're more likely to have your so child. Where are we on the agenda? Did we cover principle number one? Yes, we did. Okay, we did. So why don't we move on to yes. principle number two, get kids involved. Yes. Uh, so we've already given you plenty of examples of how you can get your children involved. You know, I would not hand, hand my... A uh, 10 year old, although she'd probably be just fine, but I wouldn't hand her this chef's very sharp chef's knife and ask her to cut the apple. Um, but here's an actually, I didn't even share this with you guys. This is another tool. This is super cool. I don't even really know what it's for. I, I think it's to cut fruits and vegetables. But when she does her apples in the morning, um, she just pushes and it makes like this little ridged. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So um, that's an option to get kids involved, um, or you can just have them punch out the middle, certainly having them spread um, to keep your sanity parents out there. I suggest that you invest in these, they're called mise en place, um, little containers. But again, I got them at Crate and Barrel, very inexpensive. And you just line up the optional toppings, ingredients, and spreads, and then give them a safe tool to prepare these recipes. Um, Jill, did you have anything else to add to that? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, getting kids involved in meal prep, meal planning, cleanup, setting the table, yes. all those Clean things. Up, super important. Yeah. And you know, at the very least, clear your dishes, right? But, right. you know, by the time they're six, seven, eight, like they can load a dishwasher. I'm yes. sorry, you know? Yes, they can. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they can even start, you know, prepping the food for dinner. Right. Listen, all of these things, they're, they're twofold benefits. Number one, they ease the stress on mom and dad because you've got helping hands in the kitchen kitchen and you know get your child uh doing those tasks that make sense for their age and their developmental stage and their level of maturity so you know uh, you know your child best you know what they can handle and what it would not be a good idea for them to handle okay. um, but the other piece of it is we know that for children to become autonomous and self-confident they need to develop skills 
getting in the kitchen, planning meals, cleaning the kitchen, sweeping the floor, loading the dishwasher. Yep. These are all skills that children can become very good at. And that just elevates their stuff, their self-esteem and their self-worth. I was going to say confidence, right? Just giving yeah. them confidence in the kitchen. But, and, and watching you in the kitchen is really important too. And watching you get excited about the food that you're, you're preparing for dinner, just so important. Yes. Um, so Jill, I'm going to introduce our next recipe, which yeah. is pizza soup. Um, so this soup has one tablespoon of olive oil, one sweet onion chopped, three cloves of garlic chopped, a quarter cup of nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is an inactive yeast that has a cheesy like flavor and aroma. Um, so great for the lactose free individuals out there. Um, but and also, uh, you know, if you don't um, like nutritional yeast or you want another option, just use cheese, but I'll explain that. You're not going to introduce it the same way in the recipe. Um, three tablespoons of yellow miso paste, two cups of cauliflower florets, five cups of water, uh, 28 ounce can of whole tomatoes, one cup of raw cashews. That's what's going to make this creamy. And we'll give you options if you have nut allergies, no worries. And then a half a teaspoon of oregano and then salt and pepper to taste. So, you know, I love this recipe for so many reasons. Uh, first of all, if you wanted to buy the cauliflower pre-chopped, done. If you wanted to buy cauli frozen cauliflower rice, that'll fit into this recipe too. So this recipe can take just minutes to make, um, or again, you can can start from fresh. So um, Jill, I'm just gonna take them through the beginning stages. I, I already sweat and browned the onions. Actually, Leah, our dietetic intern, already sweat and browned the onions and the garlic. So they our kitchen already smells really good which is nice. Um, and now I'm going to be adding our, um, let's see the directions here. That would be good, Jeannie. Uh, so the nutritional yeast to stir and coat the vegetables. So we're gonna add our cauliflower, our nutritional yeast, which is again is like a powder. Our oregano, the oregano is what makes it taste like pizza, guys. So you could use any herb here if you'd like. Our, um, actually, I'm not gonna use the cashews, right? I'm gonna use the miso paste. Um, we use chickpea miso just because we really like the flavor of it. So if you are in a household that is soy concerned or you have a soy allergy, you do have an option um, to use chickpea miso. Uh, if you are at the store and you see um, white miso or brown rice miso, um, just check the label because often there is soy in there as well. But the chickpea miso we have found is, uh, is soy free. And now I'm going to add my tomatoes, my whole can of tomatoes. I'm, I'm not even chopping them. I'm just putting them all in here. Terrific. Smells really nice. And then I'm going to add my water and I'm going to bring it to a boil before um, I add, and then I'll add my cashews and we'll continue the conversation. So why don't you talk a little bit about principle number two? Okay, That's which is great. getting kids involved in the kitchen, which we we sort of covered. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot for families, particularly around family meals, is this discouragement that um, mom or dad are preparing dinner and the kids don't like it or the kids complain about it. And so what I want to say about that is getting your children involved in the meal planning process um, can be super helpful in reducing those uh, complaints about dinner. Uh, another idea is, you know, uh, planning out theme days for the week. So and, and having your, chi your child, um, you know, give input on what some of those theme days could be. One theme day that I used a lot with my kids was one day a week. It was kids night. They got to pick with four nice. kids each month. Every child had an opportunity to pick what kids night meal it was going to be. Yeah, sometimes it was pizza and salad and fruit. Sometimes nice. it was chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, but it was kids night. And my job was, or I felt my job was always to make sure that that meal was balanced. So if it was chicken nuggets and mac and cheese, then we had negotiations and conversations about what the vegetable would be and what the fruit would be and what the dairy would be. Would it be yogurt or cheese or milk? Yeah. Um, and just the, the having that conversation with your child and having their say in what your weekly meals look like, not giving them full control, 
over what the menu is, but giving them a little bit of a voice yes. brings a lot of autonomy into the um, conversation and it brings their buy-in. So they're Excellent. much more willing to eat and not complain about what's on the meal or on the menu. That's great. So like pizza soup and cheddar dippers, that, that could be, yeah. that's totally fine. And then maybe serve salad on the side. And if they have interest, they have interest. And if not, not right. Okay. Or fruit on the side since or fruit on the side, yeah. the vegetables in that soup. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I added everything to the pot. So it was super simple. I just wanted to give our guests some alternatives, um, some options for uh, allergies, especially. Um, so if you have a nut allergy in the house, um, in this calls for one cup of raw cashews, which does give it a lot of creaminess. So you could easily replace that with a peeled chopped potato or two. Uh, you could also increase the cauliflower. I mean, the potato is really going to give it that creaminess. So that's what I would recommend. But if you would prefer adding more cauliflower, you could do that too and just remove the cashews. Um, and uh, I think that one, the nutritional yeast. So if you are going to be putting cheese into the soup, you need to wait until the soup is completely done. Uh, we actually are going to puree the soup. This is a pureed soup and there's a reason for that. I'll share with you. Um, after you puree, you put it back in the pot and you just whisk in the cheese. You don't want to cook the cheese because then it'll curdle. Um, so that is the alternative um, to the nutritional yeast. The reason why I decided to do a pureed soup um, was because there is research that shows children prefer to drink their calories than to chew them, especially at an early age, which is why you see children sucking down juice boxes and they love, you know, they love that fruit in the little sucky pouch, right? Because I can just get it down, um, especially if it's an item that's sweet. Um, so rather than having your, um, you know, child, child chew the cauliflower soup, which the, honestly, any child looks in this pot right now, they're gonna be like, no, I'm not gonna eat that but you puree it, it's a game changer. You can put it in a mug and they can sip it. Um, if it's uh, at room temperature or even cold, you, you can give it to them with a straw. It doesn't really matter the vehicle, um, but the idea that they can sip their vegetables is kind of cool. Yeah, I love that. I okay. love that. Good, good. So did you? does anybody have any questions about this soup in particular? Jill, did you have any questions or comments? Because I'm going to move on to the no, cheddar. No, I'm just very okay. interested about the nutritional yeast in there. I yeah, think that's so a it's a great source really, of vi vitamin B12, right? Ex oh, so great point. Yeah. We yeah. are dietitians at the end of the day, right? We need to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So your children could care less about B12, but you can know that, right. yes, the nutritional yeast is an inactive yeast um, that is very high uh, in B12, a, a great uh, plant-based source of B12. B12 is traditionally found in animal products. Um, B12 mm -hmm. is in dirt. And so when the cows and the chickens peck at the dirt and they consume the dirt, they're getting the B12 in their flesh and then we eat their flesh and, and we get the B12. So if you are vegan and plant-based, this is a great way to get some B12, although we do recommend that you supplement with B12 as well. Correct, Jill? Yes. If you're ready, yeah. maybe you want to talk about that for just a few seconds while I bring out the uh, cheddar dipper recipe about um, vegan. If, if you are plant-based, can you raise children vegan? Yes. And healthy? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes, 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 you can. Absolutely. And we have uh, several dietitians in our network who specialize in uh, plant based child nutrition. But I to give you the highlights, um, it's a little bit more planning. It's a little bit more conscious thought about uh, specific nutrients like B12, um, uh, iron, zinc, protein, uh, your, your and, and adequate quick calories. And so my recommendation, if you are somebody out there who's raising a vegan child, for example, is just double check with a nutrition professional or get a really good resource uh, to make sure you're hitting those nutrients, um, the important ones, particularly for brain development and bone growth that are super, super um, important in those very early years, first five years of life. Uh, yeah. You want to make sure you're hitting those high notes um, at that time. So Check Perfect. out, you know, with a with a nutrition professional. Just make sure excellent you're hitting advice. everything. Yeah, yeah. excellent advice. Excellent. Nutrition, nutrition professional being a registered dietitian nutritionist. Yes, yes, okay. ma'am. Yeah. And um, <laughs> okay. what I would also say is just very, very briefly is the toddler years can be really tough because of the picky eating aspect in a, in a vegan child. So don't be afraid to reach out for help if you're facing those issues. Excellent, excellent resource. Okay, so we're gonna get started with the, they're actually called grain-free Parmesan dinner rolls, but when I'm serving them to children, they're cheddar dippers. Uh, what I love about this recipe is that it starts with store-bought. Um, so, oops, I almost dropped that. So we're gonna be using Simple Mills um, artisan bread mix. 
I love it because I can read and understand the ingredients as can my children. Uh, almond flour, arrowroot, flax meal, tapioca starch, sea salt, and baking soda. That's it. So that's why we love this. It just kind of uh, makes the time kind of like the oven to the table time a lot quicker yeah. for me. I don't have to pull out all of the ingredients from my baking um, pantry. It's all right here. So we're going to make that happen. Um, so in a medium bowl, I'm going to whisk the eggs, the water, the oil, and the vinegar. So we're going to use two eggs. If you are plant-based and vegan, you could use two flax eggs. Um, if you're plant-based and vegan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If not, you know, you can ask the question here. Um, so we're going to use half a cup of water. I'm actually going to use a little less because I want these to be a little thicker. Um, we're going to use two tablespoons of olive oil and a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar. The apple cider vinegar um, helps activate the rising agent. Okay, I'm just going to whisk those together. That was simple. A child can do that. Yes. I took the eggs out of the shells just because I didn't want to have a mess on my hands. Uh, children can do that. That's fine. Just have them. Don't have them crack the eggs into the into the mixture. Have them crack them into a separate bowl so that if they get some shells, they don't get frustrated and you don't get annoyed because they got shells in your mix. So um, you can do that or you can just do what I did, which is crack them ahead of time for the children. And now I'm going to add my bread mix. I'm actually going to add some of the cheese on the inside. Ooh, that looks <laughs> good. And then I reserved some that I'm going to sprinkle on the top. Okay, Lovely. so I'm just going to mix this up. It's You can see it's making a nice thick batter already. Now with gluten-free recipes, you specifically gluten-free, you do not want to overmix because then things just get chewy and gummy. Um, you just want to stir enough until everything is well coated, which right now it is. And then we're going to let this mixture sit just for a few minutes um, before we put it onto the baking sheet and get it in the oven for you. So that's it. The baking mix, um, olive oil, apple cider vinegar, a little bit of water and cheese. Nice. Another recipe that children can make. And they can make these. We're going to actually give you options for a couple of different shapes that they can make them in. So now might be a good time to move on to principle number three, Jill. Sure. Sure. Okay. What, principle number three is? So one of the third ways I think is very important is making sure you have a positive environment at that meal table. In fact, those statistics or those benefits that I talked about earlier yeah. uh, related to family meals are contingent on the fact that that table is a pleasant place for your child to be. If it's a negative place, meaning it is a place your child comes and he gets in trouble, he gets yelled at, he gets punished, he gets pressured to take lots of different bites and to taste this and taste that, um, that can be a really negative place for your child. And uh, you're not gonna see those kind of family benefits, those right. benefits from family meals. So, you know, mealtime, I, I like to tell the story about the bathtub. Can I share that? Sure. Uh, a little short, yes, uh, sure. short old story. You know, when you bring your child, when you have young children, and when I was younger and my children were younger, they all four took a bath at the same time. It was like, of course, <laughs> bath express. Um, but think about when you're bathing your child, what that environment's like. It's relaxing. They yeah. have their toys. Yeah. You're talking about... I don't know, the day or you're playing with them in the, in the tub. You're not talking about the benefits of washing your skin with soap. And <laughs> benefits of smelling about, good. Your friends will yes. want to be near you. Yeah. Yes. And the, and the, right. and the best shampoo for your hair. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> what a sure good analogy. Know. I love that. That's and funny. so that's that environment that you cultivate around the bathtub, which is just relaxed, enjoyable. Um, and not talking about bathing is the same kind of environment you want to create at your meal table. It needs to be relaxed. It needs to be pleasant. It needs to be a place your child wants to be. And you're not talking about health and food and what your child's eating. And you're not doing performance evaluations on what they tasted. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just all of that just really makes mealtime unpleasant for everyone. 
you as a parent included. Yeah, so true, true, just true. Keep it really positive and easygoing and recognize that your child is going to have great days at the meal table and not so great days at the meal table. But at that table, talk about anything but food and nutrition, unless your child is asking you specific questions about food and nutrition, which of course, then you want to answer. Um, but don't drag that mealtime down and, and turn it into a negative experience for everyone by making it too health focused or too nutrition focused or education moment. Right. Not the time. Right. And when I, when we sit down for dinner, sometimes my, well, because my children clearly know what I do for a living, they look at me and even though I'm not saying what I'm thinking, they know exactly what I'm oh, thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a danger, I guess, of being a, a dietitian um, at the dining room table. But um, it is just so true. I mean, I, I even find myself, even today, I mean, like, I know better, right? And let me just say that you're, you know, you're listening to this um, event and you're going to try and implement some of these strategies. And, you know, sometimes it's not always going to work and sometimes you're going to slip up and, you yeah. know, just it is, you know, we're, we're looking at just like the overall dining experience for children and just, you know, let it go if you have a negative interaction with your child over food. And, you know, as long as you recognize that maybe that wasn't the most productive thing to say, then, you know, next time you, you, you can pause as a parent. Um, and so, but it still happens to me today, right? And I've, I've, I have 28 years experience raising children and a master's degree in nutrition education and boop, I still, every yeah. once in a while, find myself sliding into, ugh, I just wish she would eat her dinner before she goes to gymnastics, or right? Um, yeah. Or I really don't want uh, my children, and this might be a good thing for you to address, Jill, because I'm sure parents are thinking it. You know, you go to the soccer game, and I, I'm not that parent that brings, you know, that brings the healthy snack all the time. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I also don't bring Gatorade um, and chips. And again, not that it's a bad thing. It's just that, you know, my kids know what I'm thinking. And so I don't have Gatorade in the house. And they are drinking the Gatorade and like, oh, you don't really want me to have that. And you know what? You can have that. Yeah. Right. You can have that. You're at a birthday party. Have have the fruit punch, have the pizza, you know. And and so um, again, so outside of your home, I think it, I think it's just a worthwhile discussion to have yeah. like outside your home where maybe these principles are going to be a little bit harder to control. Yes. How can a parent deal with that? Yeah, it is. It is. It's hard to deal with it. Number one, I have a lot of parents I work with that have a challenging time dealing with it. Right. Um, what I would say, and you know, also I haven't had as many years as a mother as you have, but um, 23 years, I, I think what I've always tried to do for myself and my family and also conveyed to my clients is that create your home to be a health haven. It is okay. That is your prerogative, you know, have all the healthy foods and the meals and all the, all the things that you value about food and eating, create that in your home. But recognize that when your child leaves your home, you don't have control over that stuff. You don't have control over school. You don't have control over birthday parties and soccer field snacks. Um, but that's where the beauty of the balance comes into play because um, we can't control everything, nor should we. Our right. job as parents is to teach our children how to navigate a variety of food environments and situations. And the best place they learn the foundation of how to eat is at home. And then when they're outside of the home and these situations come up, those are perfect times to have right. conversations and to showcase your family, you know, food system and strategies and beliefs. Um, but a child is going to experience a lot of different things. And that's a blessing. Our job is to help them navigate those situations and right. learn how to balance. And then have the conversation, right? So yes. if you're at the circus and your child wants to eat an entire bag of pink cotton candy, um, you know, that's, it's fine, right? It's just one yeah. day in time, they're going to go back to your health haven. I love that. I'm going to use that as a quote now. So you're, they're going to go back to the health haven, one bag of cotton candy or a bag of Doritos and, you know, a, um, a sports drink. It's fine, right? Yes. Because they are coming back to the health haven. Okay. Yes. And I'm a huge believer of teachable moments and consequences. And if they eat that big bag of cotton candy and they get sick, that's yes. a teachable moment. Do, 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 do you do the I told you so or no? No, but you say, <laughs> but, 
what did, how did your body feel after that? What do you there think you, go. Right. When you post, right. you know, when you ask the right questions, you get the right answers. Yeah. It's all about the questions. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. So you'll note that I'm holding an ice cream scooper. Ice cream was not on the menu. Um, but what an awesome tool to have in your kitchen for your children. I just brought mine from home. I have them in every size. So um, if you're a dietetic intern now, I want you to, to give me the exact quantities of these at the end of the show. Okay. <laughs> we need to know that for our exam. Anyhow, yep. um, all you need to know for this purpose is that it's a great vehicle for getting batters and other things into muffin cups onto the baking sheet um, so that there's just not dribble and mess all over. So I'm going to take a scoop here. You can see I've got it here. And here we go. Oh, yeah. Okay, you can see that these are nice dinner rolls. And let me just do the last one here. Okay, and I'm going to sprinkle them with some cheese and I'm going to pop them in a preheated oven. And this is what we're going to have uh, for dinner tonight at my house um, with of some course. cauliflower soup that I had made yesterday. So that's it, super fun, kids could do it, right? I'm gonna put this right over here. Amelia, would you just take this for me? Thank you. Um, a little bit of TV magic. We had made some cheddar dippers. Um, so, you know, we made like little focaccias here. You could do like breadsticks. Um, my kids have made donuts out of this batter before, so it's super fun. Just let them have fun with it. Um, and then these we're going to be serving with the soup. So, Jill, if you want to start um, moving on to the next principle, I'm going to puree the soup. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So um, we talked about that positive meal environment as our third principle. Moving into the fourth principle, which is try to serve meals in a different way. And the different way I want to highlight is family style service. So I used to be a food plater. I used to pre-plate my children's food <laughs> all the time, all the way up until they were about nine years old, at which point my husband and I were getting into the, hey, you didn't clean your vegetables. You didn't have any of this on your plate. The banter between my husband and I started to become um, bigger and bigger. And that's when I realized, you know what? I'm not teaching my, we aren't teaching our children how to self-regulate, um, how to know how much to eat and how to know when to stop eating. We need to reevaluate how we're doing this. So we shifted to family style service. So what family style service is, is basically you're taking your meal components. So we're making soup. We're making uh, rolls, we've got fruit, we've got milk. You put those things in the center of the table and you pass the items around the table. Um, so when you have children older than five, those children can hold platters and bowls and they can take a utensil and serve. Yes. You can see, Jill, I'm, I'm showing um, it's a lightweight, small, I mean, you could even be a large plate. It doesn't have to sure. be a platter. Um, but this is a small platter. Here's another example. The cheddar dippers are on here. This is a small platter. Um, again, these mise en place cups for like the condiments and things. Yep. Game changer in my house. Um, some small uh, soup cups because a big yep. bowl of soup can be overwhelming yep. um, for children. So for the soup, um, I don't have my children serve themselves soup from the stove, um, yeah. but I do put it in um, smaller containers and then they can, you know, you can serve it this way and they can remove yeah. it to serve themselves. Yes, you can okay. definitely, you can yeah. pre-plate those soups and they can choose or not choose. Yeah. Um, but basically ki kids are taking the meal components and they're putting it on their own plate and they're taking the amount that they think is right for them. And I will just add a little reminder here that children oftentimes don't know how much to take with this type of meal service. So they are learning. Sometimes they will take too much and not be able to eat everything they took. Sometimes they won't take enough and they'll want seconds. Right. They are learning and over time they will nail it. Um, and they will obviously come to the table and they'll have favorite foods and they'll want a lot of those foods. But again, the message is we're feeding an entire family here. So we're going to be polite and we're going to let everybody have the opportunity to have what's on the table. But family style really puts um, the control over how much and whether a child is eating your meal that you have made into their hands. And that is really based in the division of responsibility by Ellen Satter. And I don't know if you'll share a link with that, uh, Jeannie, but Actually, you can- that's a good idea. We will, after yeah. the, after the um, program, we will drop that drop that link to Ellen Satter's website. Yeah. Really, so, really worthwhile. 
Absolutely. So the division of responsibility is basically a parent has a set of jobs and a child has a set of jobs. The parent's jobs are is to determine what's on the menu. So you're in charge of the menu. You're in charge of the climbing and in charge of the place of where meals take place. So the, the what, the where, and the when. Right? Yes. So the parent. So what, where, and when. That's really important yes. to remember because the what, the where, and the when is never the child's responsibility. That's like on your side of the, the division of responsibility, yes. right? And so then what is the child responsible for? Whether they're eating what you've decided to put on the menu mm -hmm. and how much. Okay. So, so, whether, so how whether, much. whether they eat and how much they mm -hmm. eat, that's yes. the child's responsibility. And never do you cross over that division. I think it's, it's it, in theory, it sounds so amazing, right? Um, yes. In practice, it's, it's hard when you it first is. get started. Um, but I promise you, can I share a little story, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a second career dietitian. I went back to school after having raised um, two children already. And when I learned about Ellen Satter's division of responsibility, I'm like, Oh my gosh, what have I been doing to myself this whole time? And I really, um, I went home that night and I changed everything. I didn't change what I was feeding my children, but I was changing the way I was feeding them. And yeah. I had at that time, my youngest child at that time was, was difficult at the dining room table. And the stress just magically disappeared. She really gravitated towards the family style and we basically just ignored how she was eating and what she was eating and just kind of let her do her own thing. And she figured it out. And today, of course, she's a great eater. So, uh, but it wasn't easy. I will tell you, it wasn't easy. It particularly wasn't easy when we were with other family members, right? So who weren't, weren't used to the division of responsibility, you know, aren't you going to make her eat before she gets up from the table? Well, no. And then I'd have to launch into the theory part of it, but, um, yeah. You know, it, it, it was a struggle initially, but I promise you, if you start practicing even occasionally, you're going to see a whole new world open up for yourself and your children because it frees you up too. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Okay. And it, it and it is a very simple comp, uh, concept. And if yeah. you have practiced it and tried it before, you quickly realize there are a lot of little elements that go into it. You do need yeah. to know what you're serving, right? That goes back to yeah. the food balance that we were talking about before. Um, and, you know, you have to know how to manage the child who's not eating, who's yes. picky, yes. who's overeating, because these issues always come up. I have Thank tons you. of resources on my blog to kind of help you dissect Thank those. You. Thank issues. you for noting that, because honestly, we would love it. This could be, you know, a four hour long program, right? Easily. This could be a whole day <laughs> workshop. <laughs> Let's, do it. Let's, do it. Let's do it. I think we have a question. Okay. Um, and then I want to puree the soup. So go ahead. There's a question. You want to read that? So, yeah. Leanne Ray says, how old should children be before they start choosing when and what to eat? So um, parents are deciding the when. So depending on the age of your child, you do want to set up an eating schedule or a structure around the timing of meals and snacks. So young children, toddlers are eating about every three hours, every two to three hours. School age children are eating every three to four hours. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack or two in between. Um, in terms of deciding when do you let children decide what they eat? Number one, as a parent, you are deciding, you know, what that food balance is going to be for yes. meals and snacks. Um, but you can allow your child reason, what we call reasonable choice. So you can say to your child, I'm having chicken and rice with broccoli. I haven't decided on the fruit yet. Um, I'm either going to slice up strawberries or I'm going to um, serve some raspberries. Do you have a preference? Perfect. Your child says, I'd love raspberries. Well, okay, Perfect. then let's put raspberries on the menu for tonight. That, that's, that's, that works great. So that's the reasonable choice piece. You're not giving the child full license over what's on the menu, but you are taking a segment of the menu and you're giving two options. Perfect. Reasonable options. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, if, I'm just going to take literally 10 seconds to puree our soup on high. Um, it, it will only take 10 seconds. Okay, that's it. That's done. Um, just a note to parents, a safety issue. Um, when you are blending hot liquids, uh, this was actually not quite so hot, but 
if, if you're putting it into a blender hot, make sure you put a towel on the top with your hand. And I really wouldn't have the children near you while you're doing this because the pressure from the steam could make the top pop off. Um, and this, this is hot soup. So um, actually the soup is done. I, I already pulled out the chicken tacos too, but let's get this soup plated. Jeannie, could you use an immersion blender for that as well? Absolutely. It's not going to get quite as creamy, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That would work very well with this. The only time I really don't think immersion blenders work so great is when I put herbs in soups. Because, yeah. Excuse me. Because the herbs get caught on the uh, blade and, yes. and it gets jammed up. But here is the um, pizza soup. I could top it with cheese if I wanted to, and I want to, so I'm going to. So there's the cheese. And um, we are going to be serving this on the platter with our cheddar, some cheddar dippers, which are super fun. And then again, maybe some fruit or um, some broccoli or some carrot sticks, anything here. But this, this is a meal, this is a snack. This really can be anything because it's very well balanced. You have yep. your carb, your protein, your fat, you have plenty of fiber here. Um, so Jill, do you have anything else to say about soup with you know the fun of dipping? Yeah, Maybe, right? so like, that's great. all good. Right? That's you all great. It. It's okay, for, it's okay for kids to play with their food. It's yeah, okay. oh, absolutely. And all end up on the floor. Yeah, and I love soup as a snack. Um, and oh, after yeah. school snack, a lot of times my children would have that. They would have a piece of toast and a little oh, cup of soup. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I'm going to move on to the tacos. Uh, yeah. We have, these are the shredded uh, chicken street tacos, four tortillas, um, 10 ounces of chicken breast. We bought a rotisserie chicken and just plucked the um, meat off of the chicken. If you want to roast it yourself or you have left, this is a great leftover um, recipe, or you could use any other protein. Um, you could also use beans in this recipe. Uh, chili powder, cumin, uh, red cabbage, regular cabbage, carrots, cilantro, olive oil, lime juice, hot sauce to taste, and um, half of an avocado slice. So I'm going to go ahead and mix this. Did we already do principle number four? We did. We did. We did. Wow. So we got, I'm, I, I got to get busy. So let me just take them through this recipe then. Um, so you add the shredded vegetables to a bowl. Oops, I need another bowl. Here we go. No worries. So I'm going to add my shredded vegetables to a bowl. So I have carrots. And maybe, you know, for the parents, Jill, and, you know, the children love color. So seeing the color is really fun and can get them excited about eating the food. But could you just share um, the nutrition uh, principle behind eating the rainbow, quote unquote? Yes. So I hope I'm, I'm sharing the right thing with what's on your mind, Jeannie, but okay, well, if not, I'll share what's on my mind too. No, but okay. You know, the more color on your plate, it's just code for the more nutrients in the foods that you are eating. So again, with, when it comes to children and sometimes if we're talking about picky eaters or just children in general, they gravitate to some of the same colors over and over again, the all white diet, for example, Yes. Um, it's not meaning that those foods don't have nutrition. A lot of those foods do have nutrition. But again, if you want variety and you want to be sort of hitting all the high notes because kids need 40 different nutrients every single day. So that means you need to get color on the plate. You need to have variety. Um, I oftentimes share, you know, when I was growing up, it was apples, bananas and oranges. And if I got strawberries, they were frozen. Uh, and, and again, this was almost 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So things were very different. Today we have, you know, the availability of great quality frozen fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and just, you know, making an effort to get more variety on your child's plate. Don't get stuck with three fruits, you know, explore. There are lots of different um fruits and vegetables out there that are full and packed full, filled with nutrients, figure out what's in season that's always going to be cheaper and, um, you know, work to make a cl colorful plate. Yeah, no, that, that's that's what I was looking for. And then also, okay, the <laughs> yeah, so also the conversation around phytochemicals, which are non nutritive uh, compounds. Um, so they don't contribute calories, but boy, do they contribute to uh, a healthy diet. Uh, the phytochemicals each give off a different color on the spectrum. So yes. if I'm eating the carrots and I'm eating the purple cabbage and the white cabbage, I'm getting a wide variety of phytochemicals, um, which are known disease preventative compounds. Um, so they're antioxidants. 
Yes. Right. So having a diet that is, you know, uh, very colorful and that that eat the rainbow came from a lot of research um, that showed having a colorful diet contributed um, to lower risk of many diseases. So, yes, eat the rainbow. And you can see, look at how colorful yeah. that is. Right. Um, right. I don't know if you could see what I was using, but I wanted to share this with our dinner guests. Um, these are very small tongs. So perfect for young children. I have, this was what I used, it's so cute, what I used for my daughter when she was tiny, like two, three years old. These are like literally baby tongs. I think these are for sugar, like sugar yes. tongs. You think, I, think yes. that's what, I think that's what these are for. I think these are sugar tongs, but boy, how easy is that for little yeah. children to use? So um, these little tools that you can find um, either you know online or in the store, they're really a great way to get children involved. Um, you could buy the pre-shredded bag of cabbage, like totally fine, like don't worry about it. Um, any Anything that makes your life easier, I'm all for, trust me. Yes. And now I'm going to plate these tacos. I'm actually going to, um, oh, let me see here. I'll get a new plate here. Great. And so we have tortillas that have been warmed. And I'm just going to take, and of course, so this could be family style, right, Jill? I take these bowls and I put them on the table along with some guacamole. I have mm -hmm. some more cheese here. I also have some salsa. Um, I'm not going to slice the avocado because we're running out of time, but we have an avocado here. So I'm going to put this all out on the table. Everybody's going to get two, you know, two of these or one to start, depending on the size of your child, the age of your child, and then just let them have fun. So we're going to add some of the chicken, some of the salad. So now, Jill, what if my child looks at what I'm serving and they say, uh, I don't feel like chicken tonight. I'm just going to have a tortilla filled with guacamole. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, do you say? what do you say to that? It happens. Bring it on. Bring it on. Okay. Now, uh, you know, one of the things that one of the one of the principles of serving family style is to really when you're planning your meal, uh, think about one or two items that, you know, your child thinks and views them as safe, meaning they are familiar foods. They're liked. Your child can come to the table and see there's one or two items there that they can eat. It might be a corn tortilla and a glass of milk and some cheese inside the corn tortilla. Right. That's OK. okay. Remember, uh, we're not looking at one single meal as validation that our kids are healthy eaters. We are looking at meals over time. We're looking at, you know, 21 meals in a week. Um, that's why when you're serving variety and you're on schedule with your timing and everything and you're gathering around that table and you've got a lot of different foods that you're exposing your child to, you raise the likelihood of hitting all those marks um, for good nutrition. So don't get too um, down in the dumps if your child just wants a tortilla with cheese on the inside. I see that happening all the time. But, um, but your child, because we didn't talk as much about the modeling as we probably should, but that's super important, right? So your child has a tortilla with guacamole and cheese um, and you are having this. Right, you're enjoying. Actually, I'm just going to show you what I did here with a with a skewer. Uh, you are enjoying a whole taco without talking about it, but you're just enjoying it. Eventually, they're going to gravitate towards what they're seeing you do. So modeling is super important. Um, one of the tricks I have here for soft tortillas, and again, I don't know if you can see it, but I held the soft tortilla and I I drove a um, skewer through it. So depending on the age of your child, all you have to do is cut the very, very sharp end off if they're super young. Um, but if they're, you know, older than five, this is certainly something that they can handle. And then you drive the skewer through it so that you can serve it. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I just want to point out that if, if family style is not um, what you feel like you're ready for right now, you can do modified family style where you plate a couple of the item yes. components and then you put a few in the middle of the table. So for example, you might plate the protein and the starch and put the fruits and vegetables and the milk in the yeah. middle of the table. Yeah. Um, you can also do make your own or um, a deconstructed uh, dinner bar. Uh, and I have a few ideas on my website uh, for well, dinner fun. bars which are just like taco is a perfect dinner bar. You, you have the shells, you have the fillings, the toppings, and you let your child go move through that dinner bar yes. and make their own version, which as a parent, it's so fun to see if you have multiple children in the family, it's very fun to see 
what they come up with because a lot of times it showcases their personality (laughs) true that's so true it it does i i love uh, breakfast bars um on the weekend and actually even during the week i'll do the plain oatmeal and then again using these little mise en place uh, play, um, containers i'll put a variety of things chocolate chips um some raspberries some coconuts some flax meal and whatever they don't use i put back so there's no waste but they're free to choose and kind of build their own oatmeal um yeah. so the oatmeal bars are really fun too yeah oatmeal bar yogurt bar potato bar taco bar pizza bar salad bar love it, bar. Love it, love a it. whole bunch of ideas two plates here. All right. So we're going to be bringing it all together here while we do our resource roundup. Um, So everything has been made. Um, I actually just threw together some quick little uh, cracker tacos here. We use the Simple Mills um, seed, the sprouted seed crackers. You can see that. Mm -hmm. Um, So these uh, actually are nut free. They it's a seed blend: uh, flax, sunflower, hemp and chia, tapioca starch, cassava flour, sunflower oil, sea salt, citrus flour, and rosemary extract for freshness. Um, and they're really sturdy crackers, so your child can drag them through a hummus or again top them to make a little uh, street taco for themselves. So we really enjoyed that. Um, and then um, I'm actually we didn't have time today to do the brownie r- whip recipe, but uh, This recipe is phenomenal. Uh, We'll share it with all of you, so make sure that you click the link. Uh, You take uh, one cup of this brownie mix, the Simple Mills brownie mix, and you whip it with two cups of unsweetened yogurt, uh, a tablespoon or two of maple syrup, some vanilla extract, and just a little bit of water, and you pulse that in a Cuisinart until it whips up, Um, and then you drizzle in a tablespoon of coconut oil. The coconut oil is a game changer in terms of making it very, very creamy, Uh, but then once you refrigerate it, it becomes a pudding. So you make it, the kids drag their fruit through it as a whip, but then you put it in the refrigerator in a nice little container, you know, like this. And, uh, you know, my kids eat it for breakfast. Uh, and it's, it's great. I mean, in my mind, right, as the dietitian, I'm thinking, whew, they're getting a nice nutrient dense breakfast. And to them, they're like, boo, I'm having brownie pudding. Yeah. It's a party, right? <laughs> so I, I was very popular when I developed that recipe. So yeah. we'll, we'll make sure that we get everybody that recipe. So just kind of a roundup of the recipes, strawberry mountains, banana boats, um, apple wheels. We have the um, creamy uh, tomato soup, which is also pizza soup and the cheddar dippers, as well as the chicken street tacos um, and the, the taco chips and the hibiscus tea. We'll get you that recipe too. So Jill, could you please share with our guests um, some of the resources, the valuable resources that you have available to them? Sure. Well, I've, um, I have a lot of books. I've written four different books, Fearless Feeding, How to Raise Healthy Eaters from High Chair to High School, um, Eat Like a Champion, Performance Nutrition for Your Young Athlete, if you have- um, Why, why uh, don't we do another, can we do another um, digital dinner party, assuming that you enjoy sure. doing this today? Yes. Let's do another one on sports, uh, childhood sports nutrition. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Great. Um, Try New Food, which is a workbook for parents to go through. Try New Food, How to Help Picky Eaters uh, Taste, Eat, and Like New Foods. And then I have a book on starting solids. So moms and dads who have babies between 6 and 12 months of age. I have programs on my website as well, online programs, The Nourish Child Project, uh, The ADHD Diet for Kids, and a sports nutrition module for the athlete to take. So building that sort of ownership and uh, fueling your own body. Amazing. Amazing. And then blog and podcast, lots of stuff. Oh, the pod- I love your podcasts are amazing. Thank you oh, so much. Really? Yeah. Terrific. The Nourish really Child, you can find it on iTunes. Yep. Yeah. Nourish Child. Okay. So how do you download a podcast or follow a podcast? What do you, how do you? You subscribe. You subscribe. There we go. See, yes. kind of rookie, total media rookie here. <laughs> so go to iTunes. Go to iTunes, go to the search box, look okay. for the nurse child, Wonderful. It'll pop up and you hit the subscribe button and then you'll get all the, the history, the old shows. I have about 83 shows I've already done and probably another 83 down the road. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then uh, for culinary nutrition, um, please visit livingplate.org. That's our website. Um, we have meal plans available. Um, we're going to be offering uh, online culinary nutrition courses as well. Um, so check that out. Um, if you uh, would like to be connected with a registered dietitian, we have a network um, all over the country of uh, really amazing registered dietitians who 
are there to help you meet your health goals um, with food. And they have access to our meal plans, thousands of recipes that can help you meal plan. And, you know, we didn't talk about this, Jill, but our, our meal plans are digital. So in terms of getting the kids involved in meal planning, what fun, right? You pull up this digital meal plan and it's just an entire calendar of food. Have your children click and drag and search and pick what they want to have. And it's a great space for family planning. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're, we're there for you as a resource. So Jill, thank you so much for joining us. You are us today. so welcome. We're seeing you at the conference in a couple of weeks. And yes. um, thank you everybody. Please share this video with your friends um, so that we can spread our mission. Uh, thank you so much.